Hello, welcome to Instinct One. This is uh, open source intelligence. So here's some announcements. Uh, first off, thanks for a great fall PTF. I really enjoyed, you know, helping helping out. Uh, we had a great time organizing it. We hope you guys had a great time playing it. It was really amazing seeing everybody there. Uh, thanks for inviting your friends. That was a big attendance. Um, Next up, this weekend, we'll be playing Buckeye CTF and Maple CTF as a team. Uh, show up to Siebel. The room is still TBA uh, from Friday, 7 p.m. to Sunday, 7 p.m. Uh, you can show up anytime. In fact, we welcome people showing up on Saturday or Sunday because that's usually when we start, you know, meeting new perspectives. Um, we're playing in the undergrad division for Buckeye CTF, so grad students are encouraged to play Maple CTF only. Next Sunday in this very room from 2 to 3 p.m., we'll be learning about x86-64 assembly with Sam. Uh, this is the lowest level of programming that you'll likely touch in CS or cybersecurity, unless you go super deep into like hardware security. Uh, it's close to the processor. It feels a little bit like arcane knowledge. Uh, it's a good time. This meeting will give you the background necessary to tackle our reverse engineering and tone suites. Okay. I, I do want to clarify, yes, we are playing two CTFs at the same time this weekend. This will be a first time experience, um, but we think it's doable um, because Buckeye CTF tends to be more beginner friendly. So if you're new to CTF, we recommend um, you solve, you uh, go for challenges in Buckeye CTF. And we will be meeting in Siebel, we'll have, uh, we'll be in rooms, um, and we'll all be kind of like in the same general area. Um, and we'll have pizza and things like that. We want to invest in this. Um, we think playing CTFs is a great way to develop your skills. Um, and then as Mona mentioned, um, we are playing in the undergrad division for Buckeye CTF. So if you are a graduate student, you cannot play Buckeye CTF. You have to play Maple CTF. Um, Maple CTF is also probably going to be much more difficult um, and our strategy is to kind of shift our priorities based on our performance in each CTF. So if we're doing very well in Buckeye CTF, um, we might um, push even harder to try to get to like a top position, or uh, we might uh, switch to Maple CTF. Um, so it's going to be a very um, dynamic environment, uh, and it'll be pretty fun. So make sure to come. Yeah, the vibe is really interesting. Please show up. Have fun time. There's free. There's free food. So at least at least grab a slice of pizza. Um. That being said, here's the meeting flag for this meeting. Go to ctf.bigpoint.com, or you can take a picture of it, and uh, we'll show it later as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. So this meeting, we're going to cover OSINT, which is open source intelligence. OSINT is everything you can discover about a system or an organization without exploiting any technical vulnerabilities to like hack into it. It'll be used in the recon or gaining entry phase of most attacks. As security researchers, we can learn how to protect people and systems against these attacks, how to minimize the amount of sensitive information on things like public social media, and we can use how to we can learn how to use these attacks when penetration testing in target. Um, a little etymology. OSINT is open source intelligence. Open source means the stuff you're looking at is sort of analogous to open source code. It's accessible to the general public, or it soon will be uh, if you're like requesting it through legal channels. Mm -hmm. Your job is to piece together information that is already available. Right. Sometimes, sometimes it does that. That's fine. Um, uh, so most of the information, uh, intelligence means that like the information is valuable. Most of the information on someone's social media, for example, won't really be particularly valuable towards accomplishing a given goal. But you might find some like diamonds in the rough, like location, date of birth, uh, products and services that somebody uses regularly, et cetera. OSINT is also called like recon, cyber reconnaissance, human for like human intelligence, et cetera. And it's generally considered easy in security because it doesn't require a bunch of like domain specific knowledge um, in a certain technical field. 
But that's not really true. It requires you to be very clever about working with limited information, and some parts of OSINT require good social skills, which is a different niche than most cybersecurity stuff. Uh, big important note, OSINT, especially OSINT about humans, is functionally stalking. Please don't be a creep. Uh, make sure you have permission before OSINTing someone or something. This is, like, very important. Uh, here at SIGPOINT, you explicit OSINT code of edit. You will have to sign this like as a, as a flag before you can do any of our other OSINT challenges. Uh, you need to follow this code of ethics while playing our CTF challenges as well. So I'm going to go ahead and read them. Uh, you will not interact with any user without first confirming with absolute certainty that they are a part of the challenge. In the case of these challenges, there's no need to create any content. So that means there's no need to message anyone, comment on anyone's page, anything like that. It'll all be there and you do not have to interact with any of these accounts. Uh, second, you will not perform any port scans on backend services or attempt to do any investigation by logging into any of the aforementioned accounts. So this is not web hacking. We're not trying to attack Facebook or Instagram's like actual infrastructure here. Uh, this is not guessing password. None of that applies. Uh, third, you won't perform invasive investigative OSINT on other people without their explicit consent. This includes friends, family, coworkers, and strangers. Well, exceptions exist to this code, these exceptions don't apply here. They do not apply in the, in the internal CTF or in like any fall CTF or UIU CTF challenges that we'll write. So keep all this in mind. Please no interaction. Please no like hacking, hacking. So why is those things important? Well, the vast majority of like real world cyber attacks do not involve being ultra clever and finding some new like zero day vulnerability. Uh, they start with social engineering. In fact, if you read like how we did books by attackers, which sometimes get published, most of the time it's like we set the reception as a phishing email, or we were going to exploit this web loan, but it was too hard, so we called them on the phone instead. Of attacks that don't start this way, most of them involve the targets using outdated software, and the attackers figured it out. All this information, how to fish the receptionist, which software is outdated, is gathered via OSINT. So that big headline up there, Google and Facebook were scammed out $100.3 million. That's invoice fraud. Somebody uh, figured out how you send them bills, and then they sent them fake bills. And nobody figured it out for like way too long. Uh, so learning what format bills are in and like where to send them is OSINT. Um, also, there's there was, can we play this video, Min? Yeah, this video is a very cool interview with a person who like does OSINT for a living. No, there's no sound. So perhaps no, we no. have to play the video on your own. No. Classic IT moment. I love when it happens. It doesn't. It's my my favorite part of my job. <laughs> I have seen that thousand dollars worth of And what's the ball? Oh my god. And they just let me do it. Yeah. Damn. Right. So yeah. I am here in Las Vegas for two of the world's biggest hacking conferences. And for some reason, I have agreed to be hacked. I'm meeting Rachel Tobac, who specializes in a special form of hacking called social engineering. I'm very nervous. I feel like I know pretty much everything about you. I instantly don't trust you. So I want you to be safer today, thanks to you. You and every other customer will be safer today, thanks to what you're willing to let me do. Well, that's the start of it. Okay, so you want to assume that everything you put on social media is public. Information that can be found in places like this can be used to authenticate you with different companies. Do you remember this tweet? Yeah. I use this to gain access to your current address. What? So what I did is I called up this furniture company right here, and I basically said, hey, we're going to buy another one of these pieces of furniture, but I need to make sure that I don't accidentally have the wrong information in the account. And they said, no, I mean, you ordered something a while ago, but the thing that you ordered me shipped to this address. And yeah, I, I think I got this updated address, which is pretty scary because that happened in 30 seconds. I got your current address. I got your birthday on Twitter. 
I called like pretty much every business that he ever listed that he used on his Twitter or Instagram. What you have to understand is when you do that, I now know which company you use and I know which company to call as you. Oh, did you get from the these people? Yes, my number and your phone number. They gave me my phone number. So I'm gonna be doing these phone calls. I'm gonna be actually live talking. So when I call, your phone number is gonna display on your call right call. This is Sylvia Sullivan. Who are you reading? No, this is Sylvia Sullivan. I'm just putting my address, phone number, paper. Whatever you use, just grab that to ask me. That's what. I am on the road right now and I'm having trouble getting access to my internet, but I need to experience your points to my friends for a bridal shower. And hopefully, you can help me out over the phone. I have all the information. I have 90,000. Is that correct? So, the first and last name is Rachel Toback. Oh, they can transfer? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Are your phones gone? They're gone. That is crazy. Can you call it there? I'm going to be coming from my number. Yeah. As you know, I have like these in Vegas. I'll put you in your office. I'm trying to do this like personal essay thing. So can you move me to a middle seat kind of in the back of the plane? Then we probably don't get that request a lot. Oh, perfect. Okay, so it's a row right before the last row and in the middle seat. You're in the back of the plane, middle seat. I have an exit aisle. I know. You can check saying, Mr. O'Sullivan, how can I help you? If I was not sitting here with you and didn't know, they said, well, sir, you called up and requested it, I would let <laughs> Think about how much you have to do to get into your class online. You have to have a password. Mm -hmm. Two factors. We're basically living in the dark ages on the phone compared to how hard it is to break into your account online. Until this company learn to change their authentication protocol, there are certain things you can do to help protect yourself. Remove your geolocation tag. When you are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, there's just no need for people to know exactly where you're staying and its places. After that, I would say products that you buy, services that you purchase, help that you try and get online, like on Twitter, that you're probably going to want to do privately. So maybe make DMs, because I'm just going to call them up as you and try and get your information. I think the most important thing is that I'm not going to victim blame you. Yes, sure, there are things that you can do to make my job a little harder. Ultimately, it is. All right. All right. Um, Sorry. Okay. 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 You have stolen and bought. Rip. Good. All right. Sweet. Um, okay. So that video was fun. Uh, that video was about human intelligence, which is sort of getting information on a specific person in order to, in this case, social engineer a bunch of uh, phone desk people into changing things that shouldn't be able to change or like giving you their hotel points or airline points. Um, other than human intelligence, there are a few different types of information that you can learn through OSINT. They include systems intelligence, network intelligence, and organizational intelligence. Most CTF challenges will focus on human intelligence because like social media challenges are really easy to write. But in the real world, all of these areas are very important for cyber attackers. Uh, so first, let's talk about systems intelligence. That's knowledge about the individual computers, routers, et cetera, in an organization. Good systems intelligence is useful information about a system that you're attacking. Any technical info that points you towards specific vulnerabilities or paths of attack. Gathering this information with OSINT won't really involve breaking in. Instead, you get the information from the system sort of voluntarily. Uh, there are several useful techniques for systems OSINT. Uh, for example, you can use like IRL information from people you know, introducing news, information requests. You can also use like port search sites these are sites like Shodan and Zumai that regularly port scan all IPv4 addresses on the internet. So you can like, if you know an IP of an organization that you're targeting, you can look it up on Shodan or Zumai to get information about like what specific web services is that IP running. Uh, Shodan and Zumai are also like, they change the landscape a little bit because you can also search by port to find all routers running a certain piece of software or all SSH servers with a certain vulnerability. 
And that means that if an attacker finds a new vulnerability, they can like find a big list of machines that are vulnerable. Another technique that's sort of in the gray area between OSINT and not OSINT is port scanning. Um, it's using software like Nmap to send requests to many ports on machine. Then you analyze what the machine sent back, and you can usually figure out what services are running a close to the internet. So it's what like Phil and Zumai are doing. They're port scanning, but you can also port scan yourself. The problem with port scanning is that like it involves sending specially crafted requests to a site that may be deemed malicious. And so it's sort of in whether you're breaking in or not at that point. Uh, really, please do not like port scan anything related to these challenges. Like we said, you're not going to find information that way and be very, very, very cautious how you're using that in real life. Uh, here are the standard ports for a variety of services you might encounter or use. Um, so when you port scan something, it'll say like, oh, there's an HTTP server at port 80, and that's the standard port for that. Uh, the standard, the, all the ports under, I think, 1000 are sort of very heavily standardized. Ones above 1000 are a little bit more of like a gray area where you can sort of have anything running on a port, but like Minecraft will always run on 25565 unless you modify something. Uh, so you can go to the Six Point website to view this slide and this table in the future, or you can just look straight to the Wikipedia link right there. Uh, port scanning, like I said, has some implications. Uh, Security-wise, you can often tell what kind of device you're looking at by which ports are open and which services are running. So like if AE, which is the HTTP port, 443, which is HTTPS, and 8080, which is a common alternate HTTP port, if they're all open, it's probably a web server. Uh, and you can like navigate to that IP and those ports with a normal browser to see what content is coming from there. If 53, 445, and 3389 are open, it's probably a domain controller. There are similar like sort of fingerprints for other types of devices. Um, ethical and legal consequences. If you port scan a machine in a super intensive way, like with some NMAP modes, uh, you might essentially DOS it, which is like a denial of service attack. This can lead to slowdowns or outages for real users who are trying to access that machine. So it's, again, this is why it's a gray area. Uh, the information you gather from port scanning can, can start to enter a legal gray area. It's not a good idea to scan anyone without permission, especially certain targets. Uh, please don't port scan the U.S. government. They will get mad if you do this. Do not do this. It's a bad idea. Okay. Next up, network intelligence. Network intelligence focuses on communications between computers in a network. So given a network of systems with network intelligence, you can figure out who talks to whom and why. Many businesses will use Windows systems, so it's good to know a little bit about Windows here. Um, oftentimes, when attacking or pen, or pen testing within a system, the machine you want access to is not the first machine you get access to. So you, you might get into some random box that has nothing to do with the data that you're actually interested in. Uh, this is where network intelligence really shines. It's like during the middle phases of an attack, when someone's trying to build off of an initial foothold and gain access to more systems while escaping detection. Uh, next up is organizational intel. Org Intel is like uh, network intelligence, but for networks of humans instead of networks of machines. It's focused on the interactions between people, committees, departments, et cetera, within information. So you're within an organization. So you're basically like trying to figure out the org chart of the information and like who talks to whom and maybe like what social media platforms they use internally, like Slack. That kind of stuff is very important. Uh, specifically, you're usually trying to find like entry points where an organization's OPSEC or operational security is bad. Maybe they use like one common email format, like first name dot last name, meaning that given an employee's name, you can just like email them. Um, they can also like always use the same airline or hotel chain or like catering company for company events. And we've seen in that video that if you know the company that one person uses for that kind of stuff, you can mess with their account. But imagine what you could do with a business account and how much more money or more resources you might be able to control from there. In a physical building, uh, maybe they don't check badges at the door. 
or like maybe there's a specific entryway that people kind of leave unlocked or open because swiping in is a hassle. Attacking a company often comes down to social engineering specific people at the company. So maybe some of them have bad security practices. Maybe there's like a couple of people who, you know, sticky note their passwords, their monitor. Uh, human intelligence is really, it comes into play here. So finally, sometimes you can pair organizational intel with systems and network intelligence to find like internal documents that shouldn't be available to the public, what they actually are. Yeah, question. Um, is it most of the time, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it most of the time the source of organizational intel usually like employees who left the company or got like fired for whatever reason? Um, they might have bad rights with where yeah. Could be. Um, that 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 could be a, a factor. That's why talking to people IRL is pretty useful for this stuff. But like, I mean, a lot of it, you you can just try emailing a bunch of company emails and see which ones resolve. For example, and that's a good way to figure out uh, what kind of email address system they're using. You can, you know, how some people like post TikToks at their job and they're like current employees and they don't know that it's a problem but like it actually is. There's a lot of that kind of like inadvertent leakage that isn't this one employee really hates the company. It's just people aren't thinking about security implications and so stuff happens and stuff gets leaked. So that is a factor. It's probably not the only factor that you should be interested in, but yeah, sure, it is one. Um, lastly, human intelligence. When we talked about not stalking people earlier, this is the subtype of OSINT that we were really focused on. Uh, we teach you about human intelligence because we believe in touching on all aspects of cybersecurity. We want you to protect yourself against attacks and to test the security of other organizations if they really explicitly ask you to. Once again, though, none of this information should leave these doors and be applied to your friends, partner, parents, exes, boss, etc., without their explicit permission. Human intelligence is like maybe the easiest field of OSINT since the advent of social media because people put everything on social media. By carefully studying profiles, an attacker can build up a map of a person that might include information like their IRL address or phone number that they thought was private. Uh, often all this info has been posted online somewhere, but the target doesn't realize how easily their accounts on different platforms can be connected. Other times, like with image location, the target might be completely unaware that like this photo they posted in their backyard can be matched up with a specific address. You can gather human intelligence from social media profiles, so check out the links, pictures, posts, about section, etc. Also, it's common for people to like reuse usernames across platforms. Uh, I certainly do this, a lot of people do this. Reverse image searching could let you link accounts to each other or to websites. Um, and then deleted content is often preserved by archivists, including the Internet Archive, who runs the Wayback Machine. So all of these resources are things that will let you view like public information that most people don't usually think of as public. Here are a couple of tips for human or organizational intelligence. Uh, first off, social media presence. Most people have two identities online. They have a personal identity and like a professional identity. Uh, some people only have one if they aren't pursuing a typical white collar career. Other people might have more than two for various things they do in their life. Your job doing Q1 to OSINT is to link these identities. People don't think that these identities are linked, but they often are. Tools like Sherlock can be used to find accounts that share usernames across multiple platforms. So that's a good tool to use. Also, like defensively, if you're trying to defend against like personal or organizational OSINT, Isolating your accounts from each other is one of the most important things you can do. There are some trade-offs. If you're a professional or a content creator, you often want to like build a personal brand by having a bunch of accounts with the same name on different platforms. Um, additionally, if you have a bunch of similar names like personal accounts, it can just help friends find you online, and that's really cool. Uh, the answer is probably to consider how damaging or sensitive a given piece of information could be when it's viewed by a specific person with specific knowledge before you post it to a given account. So especially if you have like a secret account for some reason that you don't want to become publicized, be very selective with what, with what you post there. Think, think about, think things through carefully. You know, if you really want to post something, just find the right account for the task and think about uh, ways that you could be leaking your identity without knowing. 
Okay, here's one down a few different like social media platforms and things that posted people will often look for there. Twitter, <laughs> now x.com, unfortunately. Twitter was a better name. Um, profiles exist. We'll look at them. Uh, it's very, it's very fun. Um, often they'll have like info including location, maybe birth date, links to other accounts. Um, you can use like, I think advanced searches in Twitter where you're searching over specific fields. So those are pretty good. Uh, you can also look at like follower and following links to help figure out who's this, you know, network of people or even like who are all the alt accounts of this person if they're really not careful. Uh, YouTube, YouTube profiles, uh, YouTube playlists will have videos that are otherwise unlisted, which means they're not searchable. They will still show up on playlists. Um, YouTube comments will sometimes have information, especially in like CTF social media challenges. We love to just put the flag in like a random piece of information in a comment or about section or something. Uh, that's a little bit contrived, but it works for CTFs. Um, and then like videos, oftentimes the information will be hidden in like subtitles or something like that within the video. GitHub, uh, GitHub is, is big if you're, if you're a, in the software engineer space. Um, GitHub profile page just has a lot of places where information can be hidden. So really go over it with a fine tuned comb. Uh, you've got features, repos, you've got links, social, location, email. People treat it like social media, even though it's mostly about software, people will still put a bunch of social media, like social uh, information on there. Um, you can also, like repository, check the commit history. Don't just look at the current commit. Uh, there, there's GitHub will save most of the information that's ever been a part of a specific repository, um, not just the current stuff. Uh, and then you can also look at forks of given repository, which are like versions of it that other people joint and are doing other things with, because open source is really cool and fun. Um, and you can look at pull requests and comments, which are like suggestions that other people made for a given repo that were then pulled into the repo. Yes, question. What kind of methods do you recommend if you want to make open source projects that prevent information that you don't want to be spread? Or being spread? Um, I mean, think about the target audience, think about what they need to know and what they don't need to know about the project. Uh, if you want to, for example, conceal your specific identity, make a different user that works on that project and don't link it back to your main one, oh, this isn't very common. Um, and then just kind of like really keep in mind which files are being included in each commit and which aren't. Um, don't People include like API keys in GitHub repos all the time in config files and like it sucks and that information shouldn't be public, but it is. So like keep that stuff in mind. Um, and then like, you know, I think there, there are some ways to permanently remove information from a Git repo, but like they make it very hard on purpose. So look up guides to doing specifically that if you want to specifically scrub something because even if you think you've done it if you haven't encountered a bunch of warning screens on github you probably haven't like actually removed any information be very careful with that uh here's some just some hot spots in a given github like profile page or repo that you should look at when you're doing uh ctf challenges or just kind of looking at a github repo uh, Reddit, Reddit is a social media company. That it, it is one of the social media companies. Um, it's a semi-anonymous website, so people will like think that nobody knows who they are on Reddit, but then some people will also post information that can link you to other accounts. Uh, it's usually if like you're going to find somebody's common social media handle, it'll be their Reddit handle. Um, you can look at profile pictures and parent photos. Uh, you can look at comments, posts, links. If they moderate any subs, you can look at those. Um, and you can also look at what awards they've gotten. Uh, posts, if you want to find the most popular posts, then search by top. If you want to find new posts, search by new, et cetera. Um, you can also use old.red.com. I think that will show you some more information that isn't shown on the new version about like subreddits. Um, 
LinkedIn, LinkedIn is like the professional one where people just dump all of their information because they want to be hired. People don't like to lie on LinkedIn because employers read LinkedIn and people people don't want to lie to their employers, which is a good insult. Um, most people put like more personal slash professional information on LinkedIn than anywhere else because it is part of that professional profile that you're building. Uh, the profile will often include like the profile, the banner picture, post comments. There's this weird social media site to LinkedIn that like is full of horrible memes. People will post up there. Um, also like experience, education, skills, and activity, which is basically a timeline of all the cities that somebody has lived in for their entire life. Uh, yeah. Doesn't LinkedIn also allow you to like know when other people see your profile? Maybe it seems like something they would do because people care a lot about like recruiters and stuff, but I'm not actually sure because I don't spend a lot of time there. Um yeah, so so most of what's on LinkedIn that's actually important is going to be the like very professional side of it. Social media side, you might find links to someone else's like informal social media accounts. Okay, so a tip for, for like media OSINT, if you have an image that you're interested in, um, open it in a new tab. You can right click and open the image in a new tab. And if parts of it are like obscured on the website, you can see the full version of it. Uh, you can also use things like TinEye, Yandex, Google Image Search to reverse search an image, which is very useful if you want to find where it originated. Uh, this can link accounts together and it can even link accounts to websites, but like it's not super good because often people will just repost images and they will have no connection to the account that initially posted it. They just like saw it somewhere. Um, Google Lens is your friend if you want to identify a picture or like find more info about it. Okay, so that's basically the end of the like me talking at you section of this meeting. Uh, here's the challenge collection. Here, these are all like challenges from past years that you can take a look at. We give no guarantees that any of these are still up. So these are just like, at this BTF, we use this username. Find, find what social media account the username is for. Is it a Reddit account? Is it an Instagram account, et cetera? And then just kind of like go down the hole and find as many links accounts as you can, see how many of them are still up. Some of them have probably been taken down, especially if they're from like 2020. But it's a it's a fun exercise. For the for the recent ones that will definitely still be up and that you can play right now, uh, just go to ctf.sigma.com and check out the 2023 uh, OSINT challenges. All right, go do challenges. Have fun. Have fun. <laughs>